thank you everybody for joining us today. So before I hand over to our hosts and introduce the webinar formally, I'm just going to go over some very quick housekeeping. Um, so you may have noticed that you've all joined and you will you have all joined on mute. You will be muted throughout today's webinar. However, there is a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if you do want to ask any questions, please do type it into the Q&A box. If you have any technical issues, um, please then put them into the chat box as well. Um, also, you will have noticed that we have a hashtag, Women Innovate. So if you'd like to share your experience or comment on social media, please do so using the hashtag. So formally, good afternoon. I'm Siobhan Smith, Lead for Diversity and Inclusion Programmes and KTN. That includes the Women in Innovation Programme. It's lovely to have everyone here with us today. Um, and welcome to the Women in Innovation Building Success webinar around working parents. Today, we are luckily uh, joined by two incredible coaches who will be taking us through today's webinar, Victoria Coxon and Nicola Wilcox. So Vic is an ICF accredited modern leadership and team coach whose clients are growing dynamic businesses, wanting to develop their potential and who favor a personalized approach. Many of her clients are entrepreneurs who need to accelerate their leadership maturity, impact and performance to ensure that their businesses thrive. She has worked for organizations like NatWest Backer Business and Set Squared. And Nick is an insured ISCF accredited ac academically qualified coach. She engages in regular supervision and CPD. Various clients have come from the worlds of education, finance, the church, SMEs, creative industries and the health service. She partners with clients to think better, feel better and do better, whatever they may look like for them. She believes that a one size definitely does not fit all and she is underpinned by the conviction that her clients are the experts in their lives. So I'm now going to hand over to Nick who will walk us through today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Sharan, and to your talented team who make these webinars possible. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. I'm Vic, your host, and thanks to Nick for sharing your unique blend of knowledge, experience and wisdom with us. We'd like to encourage you all to be participative. It's a safe environment, so join in and use the Q&A function. And we'll observe confidentiality by not naming anyone as the webinar is being recorded and the Q&A will be deleted after the webinar. You also might like to have a pen and paper or a notes facility to hand. There'll be lots of opportunity for engagement throughout and Nick will open it up for free form thoughts and observations and questions at the end. So I'm delighted to introduce Nick Wilcox. What more can I say that Sharan hasn't already said? Um, uh, but apart from that she's not just got an extensive coaching practice, um, she's also an associate coach and program developer for Mama Coaching, which does what it says in the tin, and runs coaching skills workshops for parents and families. She's also a mum to two grown-up sons. So, Nick, over to you. Thank you, Vic, and thank you to Shwan for that introduction earlier on. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us on this webinar, um, which is an invitation to you to pause for a moment and take the next hour to think about yourselves for a change. So I think, and I'm sure you all can share this, uh, this idea as well, I think being a working parent is a pretty challenging gig. Um, and even more so at the moment with all the additional challenges that COVID is presenting us with, both at home and at work. Boundaries between work and home are blurred. Routines have changed. In lots of homes, family life and working life are happening under the same roof with varying degrees of success, order, chaos and full onness. And we're kind of making it up as we go along because there's no real blueprint for what we're dealing with at the moment. We're all assessing risk differently and we're all making different choices for ourselves and our families, which also bring different consequences with each choice that we make. And for me, the life of every single working parent is going to be unique to their family and to their work situation. Now, I need to have a, a moment where I make a confession right at the beginning here. Um, Vic and I don't have a magic solution that we're going to be able to offer you to resolve the different challenges, demands and expectations that come with being a working parent. And nor are we going to tell you what to do, because actually, who are we to judge or advise you? Instead, this webinar we've set up wants to come from a coaching perspective, which means that we believe that you're the experts in your life 
and that you have the answers to your questions and challenges. You're already doing a brilliant job as a working parent in very challenging circumstances at the moment. And we want to offer you the opportunity and the time to be able to think of ways in which you can support yourselves to be your own best cheerleader. So step back and try, try and see if you can view what you're doing now through a much more compassionate lens. In my experience, working parents and particularly working mothers can be super hard on themselves. So what are we going to do today? We're going to start off, we're going to celebrate the good. Then we're going to consider some of the demands and expectations that we face as working parents and invite ourselves to maybe think how we can reframe them. And then I'm going to introduce you to some very well-known psychological and organisational models that may give you a different lens through which to view work and family life. And I think they're relevant. These models are relevant to both contexts. I think some of our best lessons that we um, learn as parents actually um, are incredibly useful and can apply to our working situations as well. But enough from me for now. Let's start by... Um, celebrating the good. So what I would like to invite you to do is to feed in onto the, the Q&A box, as uh, Shuan and Vic said at the outset, what's going well for you right now and what's going well for you and your family right now and what are you proud of as a working parent? We'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to give you a minute to give us some feedback on those questions. And Vic, if you could let me know when you see anything coming through. Yeah, it's just taking a minute to come through. Don't be shy. Yeah, always the way. So yeah, I've got a couple coming through that were still working and still sort of smiling about it. I, those are big achievements, I reckon. <laughs> Fabulous things to be proud of. Healthy on speaking terms. Yeah. We're still here. As working yeah. parents, we both have jobs and we're okay. Feeling closer to my family. I think that's a really interesting one. I was talking with someone recently who um, they have three teenagers and their household has been pretty feisty through teenage years. And the mum described it to me and she said, actually, lockdown and the COVID has been really good for us because the children have realised that we don't have monsters with several heads, that actually we're OK. We're spending a lot of time together and there's been a lot of harmony restored. So that's really interesting. Mm. Lots of people with good senses of humour here. I haven't murdered my husband. That's a brilliant one. I'd say that's a result. <laughs> brilliant. Lots of feedback as well I get from clients about how they're, they're really pleased with the way they've been able to kind of adapt to the current situation and they've been able to set up sort of very complementary and supportive working practices with their partners or um, families. That's brilliant. So just quickly then, why start with this? Why start with celebrating? Well, my reason for doing that is because we can have a tendency to focus on the negative. In fact, our brains are hardwired to do so. And as working parents, I think we can often be incredibly self-critical and set impossibly high standards. Or we compare ourselves to others that we perceive are doing things much better than us. But for our own well-being and for the impact that we have on those around us, it's a really good idea if we can notice when we're being self-critical and challenge some of those assumptions. It's even better if we can find things to celebrate. So my first kind of coaching-y intervention to you would be to offer you this reflection, which is at the end of the day or the week, why don't you take stock of what's gone well? How can you celebrate what you're proud of and what's going well for your particular family at the moment? We know from positive, psycho positive psychology research that this focusing on the positive and identifying things that we're grateful for or that we're particularly pleased with can have a, real, a really positive impact on our well-being. So I think that's a really helpful thing that we can do and easy to do. But I wonder if sometimes it's hard for us to do that, to focus on the good things because of the immediacy and the relentlessness of the demands and expectations that we face as working parents. And it can make, us, make it harder for us to focus on what's going well. So now my next challenge to you is how about thinking about some of these demands and expectations that you face as a working parent. So this might be a time when you want to grab that bit of paper that Vic invited you to, to take or your note facility and just jot down either some words or maybe even an image 
of some of the expectations and demands that you face as a working parent. And similarly, if you'd like to put some of those into the Q&A box, that would be fabulous. It will give us something to generate some conversation around. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Anything coming through, Vic? Oh, you're on mute at the moment. So I am. A lot coming through. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the numbers going up on the Q&A. Yeah, so, um, people feeling like they need to be superwoman, be all things to all people, get your shit together, be organised, being really positive after a little sleep and yeah. delivering successfully not just as a working person but as a parent and a teacher with homeschooling that's kind of absolutely those kind of multitude of roles particularly with that homeschooling thing that's been going on for people um i love the i love the comment about um getting a bit fed up of being superwoman i think it was yeah you know i I'm sure all of us can identify with how tiresome it becomes to have to put your pants on outside your tights and don your cloak on a daily basis. It can all get a bit wearing, can't it? Anything else there, Vic? Oh, you want on to mute again then. Interesting. Having to have a veneer to everyone when it's actually not going so great. And balancing it all, the whole the balls, juggling all yeah. the so juggling or spinning all those plates juggling all those balls feeling like like the duck in the water looking smooth on the top and paddling paddling madly to keep everything going underneath absolutely and and i think those are really common common um feelings around expectations and demands and you've echoed a lot of what i scribbled down here when i was stepping back and reflecting what are some of the expectations and demands that i felt as a working parent over the years and it's that tension, isn't it, between the things that are coming from our organisation, our workplace, our business, around the culture that exists there, uh, the demands on our time and, and the volume of work that we're expected to do. And then we go home and there's no sort of stepping down from that and taking it easy. We go straight into that domestic CEO routine, don't we, where we've got to keep all of those balls juggling there as well. All the issues around childcare, there was a really interesting article in the Guardian last week I think about the the impact on working mothers particularly because the challenges to do with childcare both during Covid and ongoing as we kind of ease out of lockdown and return to work um, and one that sort of really resonates for me is at the bottom that that balance that we play at home of being fun officer but also fun police you know it feels like we shoulder both of those both of those responsibilities i had a friend who um has a particularly feisty teenage daughter who used to say when her mum was in kind of fun police mode that uh, her mum was like a dripping tap of nag which struck me as a really harsh criticism so yeah masses 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 of demands and expectations all unique to our own situation and we'll all make different choices when we are faced with those demands and expectations and they will come with different consequences. But it seems to me that managing all these expectations and demands can be an exhausting dance of the modern working parent. We've got two often really clashing worlds, work with its focus on productivity, efficiency and profit, and then family with its practical, emotional, social, psychological needs. And we ourselves, place really big demands on ourselves about the needs of families and relationships that we have and demanding ideas for what we think work should look like. So what's going to help us as working parents? Well I think it can help if we can think clearly and evaluate and make our choices and acknowledge the consequences of those choices and also to realise that what works now may need to change and flex as the needs of families and work change. And really importantly, I think it's important that we extend a high dose of self-compassion to ourselves for the situation that we find ourselves in. We're all aiming to do a good enough job and it really does only need to be good enough, not perfect. Let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good. So having identified some of your expectations and demands, what I would encourage you to do is go on and reflect on those a bit further. And I've put up some questions here. Who sets them? What's helpful about them? What isn't? Who or what are you comparing yourself to? 
what can you influence and control and what can you let go of? Now, I'd invite you to take these questions away with you. I know that you're going to be sent um, the slides as a handout, so you'll be able to refer to them. You don't need to scribble them down or remember them. So this would be um, something you could take away and reflect on as you in interrogate the expectations and demands that you've identified. But for now, choose one of those questions and just take a minute to think about that question and think about your answer. And I'm just going to let you do that really silently and quietly to yourself and give you a minute to do that. Would you like to reflect on a couple, Nick? That would be great if there's some coming through. Yeah, we've got some coming up in, in the chat function here. Beautiful one. Stop worrying what other people think and keeping up with others' expectations. Yeah, that whole sort of comparisonitis thing. Mm. Really interesting. And what's really interesting, so we're just coming to the end of that minute, and doesn't a minute feel a long time when you sit in silence? But actually, in a minute, you can do quite a bit of thinking, a bit of reflecting on, on what is happening for you in response to these questions. I think for me, the two important questions in that list are what can you influence and control and what can you let go of? Some of you may be familiar with the, the model that Stephen Covey developed many years ago of the, around a circle of influence and control and the circle of concern. And I think that question to ask myself, what can I influence and control? either directly in relation to those expectations and demands that I feel as a working parent or indirectly in terms of my responses to them. So what can I influence and control about my attitude, my thinking, my behaviour, how I look after myself in the context of all these expe expectations and demands? I think those are really powerful questions to ask ourselves as working parents and in fact in any kind of context of our lives. I think they're particularly important though um, if we're thinking about our children, because our children will see us role modeling good practice and behavior because we're managing ourselves well. And we know that our children learn us. So I think there's a really powerful influence that we can have there over what we're showing our children. So only your, your reflections that you have in, these, in response to these and other questions could then form the basis of any plans that you may develop, enabling you to pay essential attention to your own well-being and resilience. And that's crucial if you're going to give of your best in your work and your home settings. You cannot look after yourself unless you put on your own oxygen mask first. So let's go on and look at a couple of models that may inform your thinking and actions. But before I do that, I want to kind of wrap a bit of a health warning around them. So um, I love a good model. I don't know about anybody else here listening, but I do like a good model. But I think it's really important that we hold lightly to these models. They can be really useful. They can provide us with a helpful framework, but they are not universal truths. So my invitation to you with the things that I'm going to go on and share with you now is take what's useful and discard or adapt what isn't. So our first model is looking at the human side of change. Now, this is a, um, an oldie but goodie really, um, devised by an American organizational consultant um, who developed it to help organizations and individuals understand the human side of change. It's an oldie but goodie, as I said, but it resonates for me particularly because I think we're always undergoing changes at work or at home, and particularly currently with what's happening with COVID. So my invitation here is for you to think about changes that you're currently navigating at work and at home and consider how these things may apply. As individuals, we go through three stages, an ending, a neutral zone and a beginning. The ending is the starting point for change. It's not actually the outcome of change that's the beginning, it's the ending. Something um, is, is finished, our status quo has been disrupted and things are beginning to shift. 
and I was thinking about sort of current examples. I'm thinking about, for example, those children who are finishing year 11 and year 13 of school. That's been really truncated this year for them. They haven't been able to have the normal ending to that that they would ordinarily. And I'm doing some work, doing some redundancy coaching. And similarly, there's, there's lots of feelings of loss around that ending. The neutral zone is where the inner psychological processes occur as people adapt and come to terms with this new situation they're facing. It's often a bit messy. We can feel like we're a bit lost, a little bit unsure. Things can be quite uncertain and unsettling when we're going through this phase. And then in the new beginnings, this is where we begin to incorporate new patterns, new routines, and we begin to integrate the things that are going to enable us move forward with that change. We get a kind of release of energy with the new direction that things are taking. So now it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to recognize that we could be going through any number of changes at the same time. Um, and we could also be at different stages in those changes simultaneously. In the working world, many of us will constantly feel that things are evolving and things are changing. And as parents, we learn to navigate this too. Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of think parenting is one transition and letting go after another from the moment we give birth. So no wonder we feel pretty tired with all the plates that we're spinning. So how is this model useful to us as working parents? Well, first of all, I think you ought to uh, award yourself many gold stars or reward your own medal of choice because transitions have been part of your life since becoming a parent and before. And it takes resilience to navigate the small and large transition, transitions that you're experiencing. Secondly, I think it can be really helpful to know where you are in this model at a given time. It might help you to understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling and it might give you some pointers for action. And then I think different stages require different approaches. It's good to regularly step back and review. And here again are some questions that you can take away. Don't worry about dwelling on them right now, but take them away when you get the, um, the slides sent through to you and use them as reflections to do with any endings you might be facing. So as far as the ending phase is concerned, what are losses and gains? How are you gonna celebrate and mark the ending that you're going through? If you find yourself in a neutral zone of a change pattern, what's going to help you? What can you try out in this, in this slightly uncertain, a bit more messy test and learn stage? And then as you hit the new beginning, starting at a new school, starting a new job, starting university, starting a new project, what support are you going to need? And how are you going to celebrate your successes? So, that leads me on then to say that really as working parents, we, we need to think well, we need to be constantly applying our critical, good critical thinking skills to identify what it is that's going to best help us. And that leads me on to my next model of the upstairs downstairs brain. I don't know if there's any neuroscientists out there and, and if there are, I do apologize because I am not a neuroscientist as you will see. But if as a parent or an employee or um, a business owner, a human being, I can understand some of the basics about how my brain works, then that can be helpful in helping me to understand my own and others' behavior. And it could be helpful to me as I juggle my working parent responsibilities. There's loads of simple models out there to describe the way the brain works. And I've chosen this one from The Whole Brain Child Dan, by Dan Siegel, because I think it's a really easy to grasp metaphor. And it can be useful if you're thinking in terms of your own children's behavior as well as your own behavior. So a downstairs brain is the limbic system, and it's the bit that's responsible for that fight, fight, flight, freeze response. It's our emotional response. It's the basic survival bit of our brain. And it's critical, or was critical, when we were running around the savannah and running away from saber-toothed tigers. But it's still very much a feature of our lives because it's this part of our brain that responds to the perceived threats that we have from modern day stressors. And if you think about our roles as working parents, we can list whole loads of those, can't we? The upstairs brain includes the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for all those higher quality thinking functions that we have. Um, they enable us, it enables us to inhibit the impulses that come from our downstairs brain. Uh, it helps us to think clearly. It's where our empathy is lodged and our self-awareness. And it gives us focus and concentration. 
Now, I think it's worth noting that this part of our brain is not actually fully formed until we're 25. So for those of you who are currently locking halls with, horns with some um, teenagers, you might find that useful to know. You can walk away from those battles thinking it's just a brain, it's just a brain. So the aim is that we have our brain functioning together optimally so that we can work with each part um, to our best ability. But when we experience stress, the prefrontal cortex weakens, whereas the downstairs brain, those stress chemicals, strengthen those primitive brain systems and make them ready to quickly respond to save you. But what that means in our modern situation is that we don't listen so well, either to others or to our own inner wisdom, if you like. We don't listen to our children, our teams, our co-workers. We're in survival mode because our brain is priving our body for action, not for focus or clear quality thinking. So if we think for a moment as working parents navigating challenges and experiencing acute or chronic stress, the additional factor of this pandemic is also going to heighten our desire to protect ourselves and our loved ones. And we could find that we're not thinking as clearly. We've got less focus and less motivation because actually part of that limbic system is the freeze function. And that can feel a little bit like mental paralysis. So this can cause a vicious circle of losing focus, not thinking clearly, self-criticism and making your prefrontal cortex, your upstairs brain weaker. So it can make it even harder than ever to deal with all those expectations and demands that we face. So I'm curious to hear from you, what triggers your downstairs brain? And importantly, what helps you to manage it so that you can access your upstairs brain? So if you've got any thoughts there, share them with Vic and I, we'd love to hear. So we've got meditation. Mm, wonderful. Is that using an app or is that doing classes? I wonder, wonder how that best works for that person. So we've also got somebody with a trying teenager who seems to press their buttons and what helps is just to focus on breathing. Yeah. Pressing meditation. So lots around meditation, yoga coming in. Yeah, fabulous. All of which are brilliant, brilliant ways of calming that limbic system there's a lot of work being done at the moment about the importance and the importance and the power of breath the breath work yeah absolutely anything else there Vic? yeah so uh, interestingly on getting triggered worrying about others opinions there's a good theme coming up there isn't there today? yeah and um in terms of dealing with it um being outside walking fresh air lots of themes coming up there yeah, fabulous. So lots of lots of practices in place that help you navigate that triggering of the downstairs brain. And um, and also that interesting one about being triggered about comparing to others, maybe thinking back and reflecting about what is it can I can I can control and influence about this situation. So how does this model help us? Well, as I said, I think understanding a bit of basic and simple neurobiology, you can remove some of the blame from yourselves and cut yourselves a bit of slack. This is normal. It's my brain's natural response. It's okay. And even the ability to say that in itself can be enough to help calm your downstairs brain. And then as you've all beautifully illustrated with some of your contributions there, sort of working out what helps to manage that downstairs brain will enable you to manage your emotional reactions well and engage that prefrontal cortex, that upstairs brain that we want to use for some good thinking. So you can see it could be useful both at home and at work both for yourself and recognizing what's going on for other people. You can look at others and see where they're in their downstairs brain rather than their upstairs brain and know that it's probably a good idea to walk away and give them some space at that point. So we've got an understanding of change and the way we can experience change through different stages of transition and we can apply some thinking and some reflection to help us manage those changes. And we've got an awareness for what's going on in our brains, especially when we're under pressure. So let's turn our bit of attention now to our children. What about, what about our children? We spend a lot of time and energy focused on thinking about meeting their needs and we beat ourselves up sometimes when we think we're not doing a good enough job. So I'm gonna ask you to step back to your own childhoods. 
and I'd like to invite you to recall some of your happy childhood memories. What did you like doing? What were some of your favourite games and activities? And what were some of your best times that you remember as children? So pop that in the Q&A box and let's have a trip down memory lane about what we used to enjoy about being kids. So thank you for all these good contributions. Back to the great outdoors, playing outside, making dens. Yeah, oh gosh, yeah, making dens. Climbing trees, making dens indoors. Yeah. Lanes, playing cards, making mud pies. How wonderful <laughs> is that? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, with friends. That's just given me a memory of childhood of, of my mother had a really old wooden clothes horse that we used to make into a tent shape and put blankets over it to make an indoor den when we couldn't go outside and then have a carpet picnic. Yeah. Playing outside in the snow without worrying about anything. Mm. So really some quite carefree memories there. And absolutely, that being outside, I remember going out on my bike a lot and just sort of touring around the local neighbourhood. And then as I got older, those um, time on my own reading after when both of my parents were out at work. And so I'd have my little list of chores that would have been left for me to do, do my chores. And then I would just take, you know, curl up with a really good book for the day. Fantastic. And I've noticed as well, I don't know if every other, others of you have noticed this, but during lockdown, there's a lot more people outside, a lot more families outside on bikes, walking around, and the sound of children playing in the garden. So any other things coming through there, Vic, before I move on? They're all pretty much around the being outside. Being outside. Holidays, friends, Absolutely. family, people are coming up as well. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think, and I think that what, what that really indicates to me is it's not about expensive toys or expensive outings or remembering expensive holidays. It's about those really simple, straightforward things, being outside, being with people. And also what strikes me is how little my parents featured in my memories. I don't know if you found the same as you were reflecting on that, but they were kind of there in the background. There was that kind of loving, secure home. I was really fortunate to have that. But more often than not, my memories around the things that I did on my own or with my mates. Um, and that, that sort of has really struck me when I think about this. So our, our parents' role my, was to create a safe environment and home, which enabled us as kids to play happily. And also from some of the things that you shared, shared with Vic and I there, there's something for me about um, the power of a child's imagination and the happiness that children have when they're given some freedom and some independence and responsibility. And so this leads me on to talk about my final model, which is around the development needs of children. And this comes from a lady called Mia Kelmer Pringle, who was the first uh, director of the National Children's Bureau. She identified four significant development needs to be met from birth. So as I go through these, just turn your attention and your mind to thinking about where do your childhood memories sit in these needs? And what are you doing to meet the needs of your children? So the first one is love and security. And this provides the basis for all future relationships. It's a, around the development of personality and our ability to learn to care for and to respond to others. So a continuous reliable relationship within the family unit and then with a growing number of people outside that unit helps to meet this need and it gives a sense of self-worth and a coherent personal identity. And as I said what was interesting when I was reflecting on that happy childhood memories exercise was thinking about my parents were not overly demonstrative or they weren't, I wasn't aware of them being involved in those memories all the time, but there was that underlying sense of love and security. The second area is praise and recognition. Now, growing up requires a tremendous amount of learning, both social, emotional and intellectual. And a child uh, needs strong incentives for, to, to enable them to come through all of those difficulties and challenges that they're going to face as they, they are progressing to adulthood. And the most effective incentives are sustained praise and recognition over time. 
Now, by praise, what I don't just mean is um, praise for doing, like achieving fantastic school results and things like that. I mean praise for being as well. So being kind to your little sister, um, you know, sharing, sharing your toys, playing nicely, those sorts of things. And then the third development need is, is responsibility. So by allowing our children to gain personal independence, firstly through learning to look after themselves, and then increasingly through a gradual and appropriate increase in levels of responsibility over other areas, they develop then into adults who have the freedom to decide their own actions and can accept responsibility for themselves and other people. And for me, this is really key. I think this is also about um, encouraging them to develop resilience as well, to be able to cope with the challenges that they're inevitably going to face. I remember when our eldest son was uh, doing all the round for, rounds for universities and, and um, applying for university, and he had a university visit day coming up, and neither my husband or I could come here because we had could go with him because we had work responsibilities that unfortunately took priority on that occasion so we sent him off on his own um, to do this uh, university visit and I can remember feeling really torn and thinking oh my god I really should be there with him parents go with their kids but my husband is very measured and he was really brilliant about saying no he's old enough this is really good this is a really good level of responsibility and independence when he came home at the end of the day I asked him how the day had gone thinking he would say oh you know wish you'd been there because everybody else's parents were there and he said mum it was brilliant I really felt like I was on it I was independent I didn't need my mum there holding my hand so for me that was a, a great lesson in realizing it's just good to gradually introduce more responsibility to our children and then the final thing the final development need is new experiences this is fundamental for mental growth, for resilience building, for confidence building. And in early life, we provide that largely through play and language as a child learns to explore their world and cope with it. But then as they grow up, it's by exploring different roles in relation to other people and taking on more and more new experiences. So things like going camping, taking on some responsibilities for cooking family meals, um, I was I follow quite a few people on Instagram and um, I was there's one woman who's a foodie who she and her family have been doing an, a themed meal every Friday night. So they've cooked according to a particular cuisine and they've also adopted a fancy dress approach as their one of their new experiences going through um, COVID to try and encourage their, their children to get involved with cooking. You know, I think that's great. I think that's brilliant if you can do that as a new experience. Um, I have to confess that Wilcox Towers we adopt much more of a parental approach of uh, benign neglect and on a Friday night you're more likely to see us having um, the supper of champions which would be fish fingers baked beans and a baked potato if you're lucky so whatever floats but I think it's just important that we focus on what new experiences we can give our children so a bit of a reflection then where do your childhood memories fit into these categories and how do you feel that you are currently meeting your children's needs in these areas and i'm not necessarily inviting you to um to pop any responses in at this point but um, i just think it's helpful for us to to realize that these four key areas we're doing so much more than we realize we're doing already I know that you are already meeting your children's needs in these areas. And we don't always get it right, do we? Now, Philippa Perry in her book, the, the children, the book you wish your parents had read and would be glad they have, she talks about the concept of rupture and repair. We all get things wrong. We all stuff things up at home and at work. Ruptures happen. We don't get things right all the time. And that's okay. What's important in our parental and in our working lives is that we seek to repair that rupture and that we, we be accountable, we take responsibility, we say sorry, and we build bridges. And that's also a really powerful thing for us to model to our children. Now, just before I leave this idea of development needs, I think if you think about the working part of your working parent's role, I think these apply there as well because you could use different terms for example you might say acceptance and security rather than love and security but I think these needs are needs that we all have in our working lives 
So um, an, a question I would invite you to take away and reflect on is, are your needs being met in these areas at work? So the aim of today is to, was to give you an opportunity to um, invite you to do some thinking about yourself as a working parent through a compassionate lens. We've celebrated successes, explored expectations and demands in a bit of a whistle stop tour and introduced some models that you could apply in a work and a parenting context that could help you to view things more compassionately. And I really want you to take on board the belief that I have that I know that you're already doing a fantastic job in meeting your children's needs. In my opinion, there is no role that's more important or more challenging than being a parent. And there's no role that's more likely to bring with it such a roller coaster of emotions and experiences. And there's no one right way to ride that roller coaster. Everyone is unique in their family and work contexts and will need to find a way that works for them. Now, finally, as well as liking a, um, a model, I do also love a good metaphor. In Japan, Broken objects are often repaired with gold. It's a craft that's called kintsugi. And the floor is seen as a unique piece of the object's history and adds to its beauty and its value. So I just wonder, how would it be to consider this approach in our own lives? All that you do, all that you are, are golden parts of the rich family history you're creating as a working parent. None of us get everything right all the time. And that's okay. And that brings me to the end of um, the webinar for today. I want to thank you all. And, um, and I hope that you can go away and enjoy your summer holidays, whatever they may look like in this strange world, and take your compassionate working parent lens with you. I think now we're going to look at some, seeing if there's any questions and answers. We've got a few minutes that we can use. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now. Somehow, here we go. There we go. So yes, do we have any, any questions, or any observations from today? Thank you, Nick. There's a few thank yous coming up and, and I can see from the chat that um, people recognize that it's not an easy gig. Um, and just thank you for helping us all to think more compassionately. Um, and celebrating some of those successes. It's hard when we're up against it to take time out to do that. Yeah. So we've got a, a comment here saying that it was a really calming experience. <laughs> That's good to hear. I think very often in the, you know, we're rushing, rushing, rushing to get things done, aren't we, all the time in our working days and just taking that time to step back. And like we did at the minute where at the beginning where I gave you a moment to just reflect on a question around expectation and demands, even if you can carve that minute out of an hour or a couple of hours to pause and reflect, take stock. Really interesting question come up here. How can I stop the guilt of being a rubbish teacher? So I'm assuming that's um, being a rubbish teacher in addition to being a parent. So teach it, a rubbish teacher because you've been at home being a homeschooling parent. That's my assumption. And I would just say into that, you're not rubbish. I know that. I'm sure, you know, absolutely sure. I think as working parents, we were asked to do a huge role to take on homeschooling our, our, our children. We didn't sign up as teachers. And so I think, yeah, finding ways to be a bit more gentle with yourself celebrating successes yeah um another uh general question here which affects um as mums i've just started working after a year of maternity leave what thoughts do you have on easing back into work and being a good parent and managing your household I think that's a really interesting one. I do quite a bit of work with um, mothers on our mama coaching program where we talk about exactly that. And actually part of our role in that space is to give um, mothers time to reflect on the things that are important to them, focus on values, focus on where their strengths lie, focus on their purpose as a, as a precursor to going back into the workplace. And then think really practically about what kind of help do I need? Where can I get this from? So just again, taking that, that time to step out of the everyday to give some focused, ded dedicated time to thinking about it, I think in itself helps ease people back in. 
Nick, can I just jump in there? Sorry for a second. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit uh, fuzzy with the sound. So can I ask you very quickly to just pull out your headphones and plug them back in again? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, is that okay? Much better, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, a lovely question here. We know we can't be perfect parents, but how can we stop comparing ourselves with other parents and beating ourselves up to do better? I think that's the, a, an eternal question. I, and I'm really intrigued. Is it a mother thing, do you think? Or is it, is it dads as well? But I think that's a question I hear time and time again. One, um, one kind of practical tip, coaching tip, which Vic, I don't know if you use with your clients, but we use this in a lot of contexts, is to invite people to complete an achievement wall of all the things that they do well and successfully and that they're proud of. You literally make a visual record of all the beautiful, wonderful things that you've done and achieved over the course of your life. You can make that very specific to your role as a parent and you gradually populate it with all the things that you remember over a period of time. And it can be a, a really nice visual way of reminding yourself that you don't need to beat yourself up all the time. And actually there's a shitload of stuff that you've done that's been really, really good. Thank you, Nick. Lots of um, appreciation. Thank you for providing reassurance and confirmation that our best is good enough. And that's not just me, that comes from very, very tried and tested research. So um, a chap called Donald Winnicott, who was a paediatrician back in the 50s, talked about this concept of good enough parenting. It is important that we're good enough, but we don't have to be perfect because by being good enough, we enable our children then to learn their, and develop their own confidence and skills. Yeah, another, another question here, which um, reflects the ages and stages. Um, which is interesting and are there any particular books that you'd suggest for the challenging behavior in four to five year olds I know you mentioned Philippa Perry earlier yeah so Philippa Perry's book which I'm just looking at, actually to see if I've got it to hand I haven't got it easily to hand but Philippa Perry's book the book you wish your parents had read and be glad that they had is a really good one um, there's another nice one here that I like which is not um, it's not specifically aimed at youngsters though but how to grow a grown-up um, by a lady called Dominic, Dominique Thompson, she's very experienced working in child mental health. Um, some of the, I mean, they might be a little bit old fashioned, but I think some of the Stephen Biddulph books are quite good too. Thanks, Nick. Any more for any more? We're probably winding up now. We've got a few more minutes, haven't we? But I think I haven't got anything else coming through. Brilliant. Well, thank you all very much. I wonder if this is the time to activate the Mentimeter, which is a whole new ball game to me. But I think Poonam can do that for us. We'd really love to get some of your quick feedback on today. And, and our question around that is what has been your key takeaway for today? And I think you should hopefully be seeing some instructions flash upon your screen that can, um, that can do that tell you what to do there but we'd love to know what your key takeaway is from today and thank you very much for all your wonderful contributions so if any if anybody is uh, able to do so please can you grab your phone or any other um, internet worthy device and go to www.menti.com use the code 742893 and please uh, let us know what your key takeaway from today's session was in there uh, so we can record that, make sure that we uh, are feeding that back. That's lovely to see some of those things coming through there, being kind to yourself reassurance that we all fear the same things i think that's this it's really important as working parents we talk to each other about this stuff because it normalizes things for us our best is good enough love that i'm not alone
absolutely and gather your tribe around you who can help support you with that so important for working mums yeah, we've got a couple of we are not alone on the chat as well it's yeah really resonating yeah i'm doing good fabulous that's fantastic to hear good enough really is good enough you're amazing women all of you amazing mothers Oh, the idea of the, the kintsugi idea. I love it too. It just felt like a really wonderful way of um, translating that as a metaphor for life. Another one there, I like that. The good reminder not to put too high a level of expectation on the behavioural development of children. Absolutely, that they're children. Yes, we are growing adults, but it takes a while to become an adult particularly when you know their brains aren't, aren't completely formed till they're 25. <laughs> Mending with gold. Like someone's put breathe. Yeah, lots of breathing. Fabulous, thank you very much for all of those contributions. Well, I think we will start wrapping up the webinar there today. Thank you so much for Nick and also for Victoria for actually helping move us along and share the sessions, asking all your brilliant questions today. It was actually fascinating to hear. Um, personally, I don't have a child, um, but it was lovely to hear all of your experiences to know that um, sometimes you just need a little bit of time to breathe feel like you're doing a very good job which you all are um, and times are difficult uh, at the moment so it was fantastic to have both nick and victoria explaining uh, and encouraging us along in this area um, i'm going to quickly wrap up um, before we finish today and say we have a couple of options if you'd like to still be involved in the Women in Innovation Programme and you're not already. Uh, so if you would like to get in touch with us um, or be kept in touch uh, of other activities, we have our newsletter. Um, if you go to ktn-uk.co.uk uh, forward slash newsletter, then you'd be able to sign up for the Women in Innovation newsletter. We also have an online community on World Labs. The link is just there. Or if you'd like to personally get in touch, please do email me at shawan.smith at ktn-uk.org. And we'd love to have you come along to some more of our events. Our next one is on confidence. Um, and that is coming shortly. Uh, if you're not already signed up for it, please do so. We'll circulate the link to that and our forthcoming events, which uh, Nick, Victoria, uh, Mary and Lorna are all helping us facilitate over the next couple of months um, and are all brought to you from a very uh, professional coaching uh, perspective as well to help you really uh, believe and live the experiences a little bit more. Um, so thank you once again for attending today's webinar. Thank you so much Nick and Victoria um, and we will see you all at our next one. Thank you. Bye.